Okay, we are going to get started now. So, good Nachmittag, good afternoon. Tzachayim Tovim. I'm Gina Anderson. I'm the Executive Director of the Germanic American Institute, and I just want to welcome everyone for joining us here today for this truly momentous occasion. We are here to celebrate our friend, Fred Amram, and the renaturalization of his German citizenship. Fred, we are so deeply honored that you have chosen the GAI as the venue for this ceremony. Thank you. Three years ago, the GAI Board of Directors undertook the task of defining our organizational values. Within our value of, of social responsibility, we declared, the GAI will provide education on the full spectrum of Germany's complex and difficult past and offer a venue for respectful reflection and healing. We wrote this statement as our proclamation that the world must never forget the atrocities of the Holocaust. We wrote this as our reminder to be vigilant in the rising tide of Holocaust fatigue. In an age when it's tempting to give in to thoughts of, enough already, that was so long ago, and can't we just move on? Germany remains one of the most credible warning voices to warn humanity of what can happen when fear hatred, and xenophobia are allowed to take root in society. In today's disheartening political turmoil, it seems, whoops, it seems the world needs to hear this reminder more than ever. And our value statement is in alignment with that of the German embassy in Washington, D.C., which declares, Germany is profoundly aware of its historic responsibility it bears towards the Jewish community, and towards the state of Israel as a result of the crimes of the Nazi regime. Germany is also deeply grateful for the flourishing of Jewish life in a country where it once seemed unthinkable. And so today, we take one step further in fulfilling this historic responsibility. As Fred regains his native citizenship over 70 years after it was taken from him. This work of restitution, forgiveness, and reconciliation is, in a word, hard. It's messy and uncomfortable, and it's easy to misstep as two cultures work towards understanding and united and a vision of peace. So I would like to thank Dr. Ellen Kennedy from the World Without Genocide Center, Her, uh, German Consul Herbert Quelle, Herr Professor Fred Amram, and everyone who came here today to participate in this hard work. I think we can all agree, especially for Fred's sake, that it's worth it. It is now my pleasure to introduce Consul General Herbert Quelle. Thank you very much, Gina. Um, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, I had not expected uh, such a turnout. I knew that you were preparing something uh, together with uh, the um, uh, with our friends here, uh, especially uh, Fred uh, Amram. Uh, and uh, but I was I was not expecting to be first late. I'm sorry for that to keep you waiting for I think ten minutes. But we had never. Maybe we have met. I'm not quite sure whether I could not have you s seen you in uh, some of my previous visits to uh, Minneapolis St. Paul. I'm sorry, can you all understand me in the, uh, it's, maybe I should stand here, shout, is that easier, is that better? No? I'm sorry, then you just have to come into, we can't, we can't do anything because this is a sp uh, the speaker system that just sits here, maybe we should have to We'll put it in the other room, and we even get some feedback here. Anyway, let's let's try to do the uh, to do the best to, uh, with with the possibilities that we have here. So I was uh, was saying that I may have uh, met uh, uh, Fred Amram uh, in previous visits here, but I'm not uh, but I'm not really uh, sure. Normally, I mean, this is always a solemn occasion to uh, give back uh, citizenship uh, on the basis of Article 116 
uh, two uh, of our uh, constitution, which is called the basic law. Basic law because when the, uh, this constitution was written, Germany was not yet unified. It was divided, and so we uh, did not uh, think that it should be opportune to call this the uh, to call this the constitution that's why we called it the basic law so the basic law of the federal republic of germany which then with unification in 1990 has become the law of uh, the unified uh, germany again so again today we could actually call it our constitution to be uh, just to use the terminology that is worldwide accepted so as particular uh, passage in there that uh, creates the possibility for uh, citizens to whom unlawfully under a regime that was, uh, well, it was elected by the citizens. We must not forget that. The Weimar Republic turned into a terrible dictatorship. And uh, uh, I think we're living in times where this scenario, I would not apply it to Germany, but where this scenario is no, not so unlikely anymore in many Western uh, countries, not turning into dictatorships necessarily, but we are all unfortunately going more in the direction of authoritarian regimes. Citizens all over seem to like this for some reason, and you may call it right-wing populism or whatever, that we uh, seem to uh, like at the moment. But anyway, this may, may actually lead in that direction. So um, born shortly before, no, shortly after, shortly after uh, Hitler had come to power, because you were born in September, you just celebrated your 85th birthday. And belatedly, happy birthday, uh, Fred. Um, and maybe I should take this up, but I will need to practice my happy birthday song on the harmonica that I have later uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that I uh, should play you a Ständchen, as we say in, uh, in, in uh, German. So uh, the, the, uh, uh, I, I read in your, I read in the, uh, in your, the extensive material that you have on your excellent website that you created with your uh, wife, and it's a pleasure to meet you also. This is uh, Brick Am Amram. The, uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, really a fascinating uh, site showing all the facets of uh, your life, your uh, uh, creativity, I mean, writing essays about uh, uh, the amount of uh, female eventers, uh, for instance, uh, that I, some of the uh, essays I could not assess because they are, uh, they are blocked, they belong to uh, sites. Maybe this has also to do with uh, recent protection, data protection laws of the European Union, then I'm guilty for that. <laughs> Even I've, I've, uh, anyway, the point I wanted to make is simply that there is this institution uh, uh, in the form of this uh, Article 116 in the German uh, uh, Basic Law that makes it possible for uh, citizens who un unlawfully uh, lost their, um, uh, unlawfully on the basis of this constitution, lost their citizenship due to uh, acts by the Nazis to be reinstituted into their German citizenship. And this is the act that I have come to for, and I have brought the uh, required uh, document for that. And normally, we do this in the offices of the concert general and it is uh, it is always a solemn affair but it is a small affair the uh, the person maybe his smallest family uh, come along and uh, uh, we uh, shake hands and it lasts five minutes and you have uh, you have created an event around it which is not uh, not bad, not bad at all. And if the uh, if the community appreciates this, and I take it just from you all being here, you appreciate it. This is this is fine. So I would like to invite Fred, if you give, do me the favor and come here, 
and stand next to me, and then I may give my phone to somebody uh, to take a picture while I'm doing this because I cannot do a selfie while I present. A, um, <laughs> So I will, in front of so many witnesses, hand this uh, Einbürgerungsurkunde, which reads Bundesrepublik Deutschland, Einbürgerungsrunde, Fred Michael Brick Amram, 19. September 1933, geboren in Hannover, which, by the way, is just 60 miles from where my hometown is. I'm from Herford, Bielefeld, which is 60 miles uh, to, the, to the west of Hanover on the A2. Wohnort Minneapolis hat mit dem, Aus, mit dem Zeitpunkt der Aushändigung dieser Urkunde die deutsche Staatsangehörigkeit durch Einbürgerung erworben. Die Einbürgerung hat sich nicht auf Kinder des Eingebürgerten erstreckt. Köln, den 7. Juni 2018, Bundesverwaltungsamt, äh, im Auftrag so und so. Und and I sign it and with my signature, this becomes official with day to day. Fred, I welcome you as a German citizen. You know it. And I just, I just wanted to make one more remark referring to your, to your website. When I was reading that you and your wife did this, uh, uh, due to your creative uh, activities, did this um, uh, exhibit, Lest We Forget. Uh, Lest We Forget has been, uh, ha is also the title of uh, an exhibit that has been shown in Washington on the reflecting pond in New York at the uh, fence of the United Nations, will be shown in Boston this October, November, and hopefully will be shown also in uh, November next year, but created by a gentleman, by a photographer, with the good German name Luigi Toscano. <laughs> Luigi Toscano uh, of Italian parents, one of the recent immigration stories that you have many of in Germany, because these days Germany has a share of 20% of its population being immigrants. It was totally different at the time you were forced to leave Germany. When Germany was a homogeneous uh, uh, society, this all has changed in the 50s, 60s with guest workers from Portugal, Italy, Greece, uh, Spain, uh, Turkey, and uh, so forth. And then, as you all know, we've taken in uh, over a million uh, refugees from uh, the Middle East, mostly from Syria since uh, 2013, to be precise. 2015 was the major uh, uh, wave of that uh, uh, immigration, but it started much um, earlier, actually. So um, uh, with, this, with this immigration uh, story of Germany, we're connecting these days to other countries that have a rich immigration history. We will never get to the state of the United States, which is, except for the Native Americans, purely immigration. And uh, uh, we, can, we will have time to talk about this and other uh, 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 issues when we, w when we gather. I look at this here. I'm at the end. Uh, it's 3.30. I'm coming to the <laughs> conclusion of my uh, remarks. Uh, so uh, lest we forget is a title that not only ex applies to your um, uh, exhibit, and I hope you do not claim copyright violation <laughs> with regard to another connected great exhibit, which is that of Luigi Toscano, who is doing uh, portrait photos, oversized, two meters fifty high, just the heads of Holocaust survivors. And he was just recently in uh, in uh, uh, Chicago and Skokie at the Holocaust uh, Mu Museum and Educational Center with the director, Susan Abrams, who is a good friend of mine, uh, taking photos of some of the survivors who live in the Skokie uh, area. Uh, and uh, you mentioned that you had taken your photograph, uh, your, your portrait, but not your photograph by Luigi Toscano. 
so um, well, we'll see. I hope the uh, exhibit comes to uh, Chicago next year. We're looking for a spot. And uh, I wish you good health. I wish you all the best. Uh, just be as critical and as observing of German domestic politics as we Germans all are. And I can guarantee you that uh, the German government will uh, not uh, permit uh, the right-wing extremism that is becoming vocal in Germany, as it is, unfortunately, in so many other uh, uh, countries uh, uh, in, in Europe uh, to uh, gain the upper hand. Thank you for this decision. And to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks to, uh, again to the Germanic American Institute for making this uh, possible. Let's enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you for your attention. And now, our featured superstar of the day, I'd like to welcome up Mr. Fred Amram. Right. Thank you, thank you. Dearly beloved, my sermon for t today <laughs> comes from the book of Leviticus. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> I, I, want, I, want to thank, I want to thank all of you for coming here, friends and family, and, and, and my wife, Sandra, and all of the neighbors. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful to be amongst family here uh, at the GAI. I want to thank Linda DeRude, uh, Gina Anderson, who, who helped plan this thing, put it all together. Uh, it's, I've presented here twice, and they keep inviting me back, uh, so they must be very understanding. Uh, the last time I spoke here, I talked about forgiveness, about redemption, about healing. Uh, I talked about Stolpersteine, which are stumble stones that uh, are put on many streets in German towns with the names of people who did not survive the Holocaust, the dead, and, and these stumble stones made, are made for you to stumble so you trip over them and you can see then the name of a victim of the Holocaust, and it says murdered by, and birth date, and death date. Um, but we're here today for Wiedergutmachen, for making amends, and, and, and that's very exciting. Um, thank you, Herbert Quelle, uh, the German consul. It's, it's a great honor for you to come here and let me do this with family rather than my coming to Chicago. Um, and I want to thank, thank uh, Herr Quelle for suggesting my theme, uh, the book of Leviticus. Oh, more about that later. <laughs> why, why did I want my German citizenship returned was the question by a reporter. Uh, so that folks would make a fuss about me, as you're doing today. <laughs> and Linda and Gina had planned a birthday party because my birthday has indeed just passed. Uh, and they had planned German cake and German wine. Uh, Linda, where are you? It's not too late. <laughs> um, but I wanted more. I wanted to generate an occasion where we could talk about stateless children. I wanted to generate an occasion where we could talk about children without a home. I want, wanted to talk about the issue of refugees 
in the 21st century. A and we've created that. And so thank you to Ellen Kennedy for being here and who really is the star speaker of, uh, of, of the afternoon. Uh, I have just a few more remarks um, by way of telling how I got here. Um, I wasn't always convinced that I ought to accept the offer of reinstating uh, my citizenship. Uh, I belong to a survivors, a Holocaust survivors group, and in it are survivors from Greece and, uh, and Hungary, Czechoslovakia, uh, Austria, and of course Germany, Romania, other countries. And I asked them, I told them, uh, the German government has offered to reinstate my citizenship. Shall I accept that? And the group was divided perfectly in half. Half of them said, oh, that's awful. You should stay away from those people. They always have been bad. They still are bad. They will always be bad. Uh, you should not even talk with those people. The other half said, oh, this is an opportunity. They said, Chancellor Merkos has been the absolute best in understanding the refugee problem. There are more refugees in Germany now than any other European country. You should accept citizenship so that you can stand next to Chancellor Merkos and, and to say, I'm with you. And so here I stand, ready to accept more refugees, and hopefully um, to the United States at some point. But Consul General Queller really did discuss, really did motivate my theme from Leviticus, as much as I tease about it. Before we had this event, he pointed out that this is the week of Sukkot, a Jewish holiday. And I really admired that sensitivity. Would it offend the Jewish community if during Sukkot we had, uh, we had a celebration of this kind? Well, Sukkot, as you know, is, is a very minor holiday, and the only sort of important days are the first two days and the last two days of the Sukkot week. Uh, we're in the middle, um, hardly important. Like most fall holidays, it's a harvest occasion. But Hakvela brought to my attention that it was Sukkot. And I began to think about it more deeply. And the origin of Sukkot is that it commemorates the Hebrews wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. We were escaping slavery in Egypt. The ancient Hebrews there in the wilderness were stateless, were refugees, as was I. How appropriate that this special day of my renaturalization falls during the week of Sukkot. Now, by now you know uh, I'm a professor and I'm going to give you a lesson whether you like it or not. Um, Sukkot is a Sephardic pronunciation of Sukkot. When I was a boy in Germany, I said Sukkot. I celebrated Sukkot. 
which is the Ashkenazi way of pronouncing the same thing. Now most Americans use the Israeli Sephardic pronunciation, which is Sukkot. Sukkot is the plural of sukkah. Sukkah is a booth, a hut, a fragile temporary structure that might be used for a meal or a few meals, a night of sleep or a few nights. The prescription of how to build a modern sukkah includes that one must be able to see the sky that gives you a sense of how fragile this building is. The, this festival of booths, of temporary dwellings, of huts, tells the refugee story. It's really, it's really the second half of the Passover story. Passover, as you know, is a spring holiday, but it has greater meaning than planting crops. At Passover, we commemorate how the ancient Hebrews were slaves in Egypt. Now, whether you believe these biblical stories or not is totally irrelevant. The symbolism is incredibly important today. At the Passover Seder, we say, I was a slave in Egypt. I, I was a slave in Egypt. I must identify with the suffering of those uh, allegedly thousands of years ago. And now, as I, as we, wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, we must identify with the refugee experience. I was a slave in Egypt tells us that if we have the empathy, then we can learn compassion. We can understand the feeling of the slave. If we say I lived in a booth, in a hut, in the desert for 40 years, we can develop the compassion through our empathy for the refugee experience. How appropriate that this special day, my renaturalization, falls during the week of Sukkot. So I thank you for drawing that to our attention. A reporter asked me, how do I feel? Um, And it's mixed. Sukkot week is a week of rejoicing. It's the only holiday with a specific commandment to rejoice, which has always struck me as bizarre. I command you to be happy <laughs> or else. But I do rejoice at this event. And yet it's bittersweet. It's sweet that we are building bridges. We are speaking about atoning. We are speaking about making amends. And yet it's bitter in that the Holocaust happened. To me it's bitter that my citizenship was taken away. My birthright was taken away. It's mine, it was taken away. We ought not to have a ceremony to give it back to me. I'm bitter about the six million. I'm bitter about my cousin Altje, who on the 19th of February, 1943, at the age of three and a half, was stripped of her clothing, pushed into an Auschwitz gas chamber, cremated, and all that was left was ashes and smoke. And then all that I have left is a fading photo and a fading memory. 
And so today is bittersweet. Before I sit down, I'd like to stop for a brief commercial break. Um, Gina and Linda uh, do wonderful work here at the Germanic American Institute. They're very shy about fundraising. And they now have an opportunity to do some fundraising, which they'll be shy of talking about. Now, I've written a memoir. It's a wonderful book. <laughs> <laughs> Humbly speaking. It's a memoir that tells stories that are bittersweet, some happy, some not, that tell about my growing up in Nazi Germany, my coming to America as a refugee and living in New York City, and the GAI is selling that book today, and all of the money goes to the Germanic American Institute, so it will be a fundraiser for them, so they can put on more opportunities like this. Uh, and if somebody wants a signature, I will be happy to autograph afterwards. So again, I thank you for sharing this special occasion with me. I thank you for sharing this occasion for Vida Gutmachen, for making amends. I thank you all for helping me, helping us for build, to build bridges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred. And our last speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Ellen Kennedy from the World Without Genocide Center. So with that, welcome, Dr. Kennedy. I was very honored when Fred asked me to participate in this event for three reasons. First, he's my friend, and it's very meaningful for me to share this day with him. Second, I too am Jewish. My story is a little bit different than Fred's. My grandparents all left Europe early in the 20th century, before the Nazis and before the Holocaust. However, their siblings and their extended families remained in Lithuania, on my father's side, the Narotskis, and in Belarus, on my mother's side, the Rices. And none of them survived. So today is a, a way for me to pay tribute to their memories. Thank you for that, Fred. And finally, Fred gave me the opportunity to draw the connection from his story and his citizenship more than 70 years ago to crises in the world today, from our local moment right here, right now, to the global stage. I believe there is probably almost nothing in the world worse than to be stateless. In 1935, the German parliament passed two important laws known as the Nuremberg Laws. The first one was called the Law for the Protection of German Blood and Honor, and it forbade marriages and extramarital sex between Jews and Germans. The second one was the Reich Citizenship Law. Jews could not be citizens of Germany. And that law stripped Fred and his entire German family of their citizenship, and they became stateless. In 1949, the German government started the program that we just witnessed today, the renaturalization of citizenship for German Jewish Holocaust survivors and for their descendants. This is part of transitional justice. Think about it, after a terrible atrocity like the Holocaust, a society has to move forward. The human rights abuses, those wrongs must be repaired. And that process takes many forms. Typically, in our country, we focus on prosecuting and punishing the perpetrators. But after the Holocaust, only a small percent of those who committed those horrors were punished. And there have been many other forms of justice involved as well, reforming the legal systems, developing new form of government, paying reparations, 
and Germany has indeed paid reparations to the State of Israel and to individual survivors and to their descendants. Another step is to create memorials. There are places of memory and honor throughout Germany, wonderful places, particularly in Nuremberg and in Berlin. This ceremony also represents transitional justice. The wrong that was committed, taking away Fred's citizenship, can never really truly be restored. He and his family were forced to flee in order to stay alive. They lost their homeland, their language, their culture, their neighbors, their community. Forever, it's gone. But this renaturalization is just what Fred said. It's a way of making amends, of apologizing, of saying, please come back. We welcome you to return, and to return as a German. And thousands of Jews have said yes. Fred didn't know the following fact until I mentioned it. And he asked me to be sure to share it with you. In 1492, and he did know this, of course, the during the Inquisition, Queen Isabella of Spain expelled the Jews who lived in Spain and Portugal, all of them. In 2015, more than 500 years later, both Spain and Portugal offered citizenship to the descendants of those Jews. And more than 6,000 Jews are now newly naturalized citizens of Spain and Portugal. I want to talk about statelessness, what it is, and why it matters as desperately today as it did in 1492 and in 1935. Stateless people are called many things. They're called non-persons, unclaimed, outcasts, legal ghosts, the ultimate unforgotten people. In 1948, in the aftermath of World War II, the United Nations passed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There are 30 articles in that UN Declaration, and they specify the rights that every human being should have. And number 15, as you see on the screen, says, everyone has the right to a nationality. Fred had that right. Nobody shall arbitrarily be deprived of a nationality, nor denied the right to change one's nationality. So what happened to Fred was a denial of that right. He was arbitrarily deprived. And these words, nationality and citizenship, we can use interchangeably. Six years after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UN passed the Convention on the Status of Stateless Persons. If you don't have a nationality, you're not a citizen of any country, and that means you're stateless. And this UN Convention defined and codified statelessness. It provides minimum standards of treatment for stateless people, such as giving them the freedom of religion wherever, wherever in the world they are. And why did the UN have to do this? Because of the millions and millions of people who were stateless after World War II, Jews and others who lost their citizenship. And once the UN had that definition of statelessness, they had to figure out what to do to reduce the number of those millions who were stateless. And that was the 1961 UN Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness practices to protect people who are stateless and to provide means for them to become citizens wherever they are. They are. There are 195 countries in the world. 90 countries have ratified the 1954 convention. 71 have ratified the 1961 convention. Who can tell me the name of a country that has not ratified either of those conventions, the United States. This will be a theme, folks, so you can shout out the answers. Let's look a little further. A common way that people get their citizenship is from their parents. And in 1979, 
The UN passed CEDA, as it's called, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. CEDA also has 30 articles, and Article 9 specifies women shall have equal rights with men with respect to the nationality of their children. And that seems really obvious to us. But women do not have equal rights with respect to the nationality of their children. Only six countries on the planet have now ratified CEDA. Sudan, Iran, Somalia, Palau, Tonga, and the United States. That's right. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child addresses the issue of a child's identity and nationality. Article 7 states, all children shall have the right to a legally registered name and nationality. Every country on the planet, except one, has ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that country? The United States. Children's right to a nationality is a serious issue. Children who don't have a nationality will be disadvantaged and endangered throughout their entire lives. Over a third of the world's stateless people are children. There are at least 10 million stateless people in the world. Some estimates are as high as 12 million. And more than 3 million of those stateless people are children. And where are the world's stateless people? They're all over the globe. Just by, by area, Myanmar, Nepal, Thailand, Malaysia, the Dominican Republic, Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, Estonia, Latvia, Russia, Europe, the Ivory Coast, Kenya, and where else do you think we find stateless people? in the United States. A group of stateless people in the United States have formed an organization called United Stateless, a network of stateless people in our country and their allies who are working closely with international human rights groups and with think tanks. The US does not have a viable legislative framework for dealing with statelessness. And this sets us apart from other developed nations. Spain and France, for example, issue residency permits to people who are stateless. Some US legislators, led by Senator Patrick Leahy, have made this an important issue. There are stateless people in virtually every country, people who are not recognized as a citizen in any country in the world. So what's the difference between a refugee and a stateless person. A refugee has fled from his or her country owing to a well-founded fear of persecution as defined in that 1951 UN Convention. But all, not all refugees are stateless. For example, my friend Maryam Mohammed is a Somali refugee. She was not stateless, she was a Somali, but she's a refugee from that country because of the fear of persecution if she returned. A stateless person can be a refugee, but not all stateless persons are refugees. For example, Jews in Germany who lost their citizenship but never left Germany were stateless, but they were not refugees. They remained in that country. Some people are stateless and refugees, and that was Fred. Fred and his family first were stateless, and then they became refugees when they fled from Germany to the Netherlands and then to the US. So being stateless can cause someone to become a refugee if they are fleeing and go somewhere, and refugees can become stateless as well. A refugee can flee to another country without any documents or proof of citizenship, and he or she is then stateless in that new place. This is a passport from Myanmar, also known as Burma. Nearly 800,000 Rohingya Muslims in Burma have been tortured, raped, 
and eventually they have been fleeing to neighboring Bangladesh. They have no citizenship in Myanmar. No citizenship in Myanmar. They have been deprived of those citizenship rights for decades. They are now refugees in Bangladesh and they have no chance of being granted citizenship in Bangladesh. Today, right now, they are stateless and they are refugees. Both the Consul General and Fred mentioned the crisis in Syria. It has created the worst refugee crisis since World War II. We now have more than 66 million refugees in the world. And this, for many Syrians, has also been a crisis in statelessness. Many of the people who have fled from the war in Syria did not have nationality to begin with. Being born in Syria does not grant nationality. Being born in the, in the United States grants us nationality, but that's not true in many parts of the world. Simply being born in a place is not a guarantee of citizenship. So before the current war in Syria that started in 2011, there were stateless people because of gaps in nationality law or because certain groups, such as the Kurds, were deprived from having nationality. The UN estimates that there were 160,000 stateless people in Syria in 2016, and that doesn't even include half a million Palestinians. 300,000 children have been born in exile to people who have fled from Syria. These are unregistered births unregistered, with no documentation. If you don't have a birth certificate, how do you prove your citizenship? Or how do you prove the citizenship of your child? Children who are born outside of Syria have nationality only through their father. Children who can't prove that their father is Syrian can't become a Syrian national. So why can't someone prove a father's citizenship? Refugees flee with the clothes on their backs, and they often have no documents of any kind. So it's likely that a father may have no proof of his citizenship. And yet another reason is that in at least a quarter of Syrian refugee households, no father is present. He's either away fighting or he's been killed. So what are the consequences of statelessness? What happens to stateless people? Citizenship allows us to access our human rights. Without citizenship, children and adults are blocked from school, from voting, from getting an ID, from owning property, from having health care. Statelessness in Syria is complicated. It has to do with, whoops, we've just jumped, sorry. It has to do with nationality law. There we go. Female-headed households can't pass down citizenship. 27 countries in the world today limit a woman's ability to pass nationality to a child by birth. Civil registration systems. People register births and deaths in different areas in different ways in, in Syria now. In the Assad regime controlled region in one way, in rebel controlled regions in another. So there's no uniformity. There are so many different kinds of documentation for citizens, for non-citizens, for Palestinians, for non-state documents, and so many of the documents have been destroyed in the fighting. Refugees, many are undocumented, unregistered in the places where they have fled. Child marriages, under Syrian law, it's a punishable offense. But there's a rise in early marriages among refugees. In most countries, there's a minimum age for marriage. And if a couple marries under that age, they don't register that marriage because it's a punishable offense. So the child then will never be registered. 
unmarried parents. Many people, especially in rural areas, never officially got married. So these are some of the many causes of statelessness in today's worst crisis. Consequences. Repatriation may be denied, meaning the opportunity to prove citizenship and eventually, when peace arrives, to return. Stateless people can, refuse, can be refused to be integrated into the host country. And when the UK, for example, specified that they would accept Syrian people, they specified Syrian nationals only, people who had documents if they were stateless or had no documents to prove their nationality. They could not belong. <coughs> the UN has a campaign to try to end statelessness, tell 10 million people in the world. That's twice the population of Minnesota. Another way to think about it is it's the population of West Virginia, Idaho, Hawaii, New Hampshire, Maine, Rhode Island, Montana, Delaware, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Alaska combined. Combined, all the people in all those states would equal the number of stateless people, people in the world. Since 2013, 12 countries have reformed their laws to include maternal inheritance of nationality, but there's still 27 countries that don't allow it. So the UN is hoping to waive fees for people to register, to get documents, to open civil registration, but there's pullback from many host countries who are concerned about having large stateless populations. Emily, would you start the, the short video? Um, I want you to take action. The most important thing that you can do, that we all can do, is to recognize the significance of citizenship. And one of those most important attributes is the right to have a voice in the political process. Colleen Feige, the president of the Edina League of Women Voters, is here today to register people to vote. If you've never registered, do so today. If you've moved recently, you need to re-register with your new address. If you are eligible to vote on November 6th, do not leave today without being a registered voter. You can also take an absentee ballot with you. And starting today, you can register to vote right now, right here. Today is not only Sukkot, a fitting day for Fred's ceremony. Today is National Voter Registration Day. So today is the most appropriate day for us to honor Fred to be sure that we all are registered to vote. Second, please raise awareness about this terrible problem of statelessness. Support the I Belong program. Advocate with our elected officials to address this problem for people in the US. Help to create that path for nationality. Advocate for the United States to sign the 1951 and 19, uh, 1951, 54 and, and 1961 conventions on statelessness. And support the rights of refugees. In a world that's dominated by nation states, a person's nationality is the source of individual and collective rights and freedoms. Hannah Arendt was a German Jewish philosopher and a great political theorist. During the Holocaust, she was briefly imprisoned by the Gestapo, stripped of her citizenship, and she too fled from Germany and became an American citizen. And I share here, oops, share here her words. She once said, without a nationality, a person has no right to have rights. So remember Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has a right to a nationality. Please visit our website 
for resources on statelessness, the texts of those UN conventions, policies for lawyers in the US working with stateless people, the manuscript and slides that you may wish to use here, and the video and photo, uh, f photos from today's event that will be available next week. Fred was a ghost of a person with no right to have rights. He was both stateless and a refugee. Think of more than 10 million people in the world who are like Fred. Everyone has the right to have rights and the right to have a nationality. Thank you, Fred, for the honor of sharing in today's ceremony. Dr. Kennedy. So in closing, the GAI and World Without Genocide would like to extend our sincere thanks to our event co-sponsors for making this event possible today. That includes Global Minnesota, the Minnesota chapter of the Federal Bar Association, Mount Zion Temple, and the United Nations of Minnesota. Um, a special thanks is also owed to our documentation crew, the people who've been working hard behind the scenes with cameras and um, and video equipment, that would be photographer Ronald Levitis, thank you Ronald, and the videographer Matt Utesh. And finally, vielen Dank to the GAI Damen Club for hosting that wonderful German tradition that we're all about to partake in, which is an afternoon Kaffee und Kuchen. These are all homemade, hausgemacht Kuchen. And, um, you know, I firmly believe that peace can be achieved through sharing of cake, right? If the whole world just sat down together and shared some cake, we'd probably make a lot of progress. So let's all do our part today towards world peace and celebrating Fred's 85th birthday. And we'll make our way right across the hallway here to the buffet room where we have cafe, Kuchen, no wine, but we do have Apfel Shorla. So thank you all for coming today.